Welcome to Trekosophy, the Star Trek philosophy podcast. Joining me in the studio today, we have our fearless leader. He could have been Kai, but he wanted to keep his eligibility open for the Vedic Olympics. It's Ben McLean. Well, I, my steps are guided by the prophets. And he looked into the orb, and the orb looked back into him. It's Brandon Kirby. What if I had a mirror? What would happen then? <laughs> and our technical guru, the guy who not just goes to the Celestial Temple, but he builds his own, Chris McGee. And the Teamsters Union won't let me hear the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I am Bill Allen, a.k.a. the guy in the red shirt, and this is Trekosophy. Tonight's topic is uh, the Kais and Bajoran religion. Yeah, we've sort of done... Bajoran religion and the prophets before, but this is more about the Kais. And I might say, you know, if I was going to make an introduction for Bill, I would say uh, he's the Vedic that we send to uh, examine the text of the Costa Maja just to make sure that the uh, rule about only the Kai being able to see it is actually true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so, so he's the, the Vedic in the red robe. Uh, anyway, um, so the, the question of of the the uh, the Bajoran religion is one that we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast already, but it seems to be a, a, a source of endless trekosophizing. And the first thing w that I was going to try and bring up was what do we really mean? Well, first, I think Chris hit on something earlier that I think is very much a valid observation to make. Uh, Chris observed that there's no proper name for the Bajoran religion. It just gets called the Bajoran religion or following the prophets. And it makes uh, sense, Ben. You actually pointed out that it makes sense because if you grow up on a world where you know everybody in the world only worships you know, that one religion, you're not going to necessarily have a name for it to distinguish it from another religion that would be on that world. It would just be natural. It'd be part of your life. So you wouldn't yeah. have for it unless that's, you started interacting with other worlds. And that's what happens, of course. Yeah. And, and I guess you could argue that there was at least one other religion on Bajor, and that was the oh. Paul Wraith cult. But they only show up in the later seasons. So, you know. Anyway, but then again, they're sort of partly this. In a way, they they sort of come out of the same religious system. But, you know, in that sense, you could say that Satanism and Christianity are sort of in the same system because both of them posit the existence of this being Satan. They just have different evaluations of the fact, or the fact that, or the 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 claim of fact. Anyway. Yeah, so the Bajoran religion is the religion of Bajor, and in the first episode, Emissary, Kira Norris says that it's the only thing keeping her people together. And I think it's only differences between religions that have actually given them names. Because I don't think we would refer to, say, you know, Christianity if there wasn't if there weren't other religions to compare Christianity against, like Judaism or Islam or any of the Eastern religions or any of that. And the same goes for each of the other religions. I don't think that, say, Hinduism would be called Hinduism if there weren't other religions or ideologies to uh, compare it against. Um, and I think probably oh, right. if we had to draw a parallel to our own culture – we could compare the Bajoran religion to Catholicism, uh, whereas Bajorans have a Kai that's elected to be the spiritual leader. We've got like the Pope here to be the leader of, of uh, uh, the Catholics. Um, or a superintendent. I mean, to, to put it in Protestant terms, too. I mean, Protestants also have a hierarchy. Okay. It's not just Catholics who have the Pope. I mean, there's... Well, that's the one that's mo most well-known, probably. For sure. That's the reason yeah, why I bring sure. that up. I yeah. might at some point need to give you guys my brief history of Christianity speech, but I think I can avoid that right now. Not because what you guys were saying was wrong, but to explain some of that for the audience. But anyway, I think we... Uh, one thing I, I think we ought to try and address... 
briefly, and I hope we can keep this very briefly, is what do we really mean by a religion? But I need to be very careful because if I make that too broad, then that'll take up the whole episode, and we don't want that. Uh, so what I want to ask really is what do we mean by the Bajoran religion here? When we make it specific, so I'm not asking what is the essence of religion in general. I'm asking what are we really referring to when we refer to the Bajoran religion? Are we referring to a lived experience of, say, you know, orb experiences and people believing that the prophets guide their lives or, or anything like that? Or are we referring to a group of people, the believers who gather in the temples or shrines or whatever they are for whatever their religious services are? Or are we referring to an institution of which the Kai is the head or, or, or president or leader or what have you? Which sense of religion do we really mean when we refer to the Bajoran religion? Well, um, if I had to... Uh put in my two cents on it, I would think that all three of those, the lived experience, group of people, and an institution, all kind of go hand in hand, but maybe the institution in, in terms of the Bajoran religion would be a little less so, and probably more so on the lived experience uh, definition of religion. Well, I you see there are, Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Ben. Well, um, yeah. Give us your opinion, Ben. Then Kirby. Okay. Well, I wasn't. Really, I was going to simply lay out what some different views people have taken are. There are some people who usually they like to refer less to religion and more to what they call spirituality. But there are people who who exclude the institutional or organizational aspect. They try to emphasize the lived experience at the expense of the or institutional or organizational and communal aspects. And these people usually, like I said, they usually refer to spirituality more than organization. And they also are, are usually very dismissive of theology in general. But they you know, would say something like, you know, they still find uh, what's that poetic uh, term, books and brooks and sermons and streams and so forth, you know, where they sort of find religion or spirituality sort of everywhere. And then there's people who take it to a completely opposite extreme and they emphasize the organizational and communal aspects over everything else. The definition of being a Catholic is, you know, Rome has spoken, the matter is closed. You know, it's it's more about uh, conforming to a a an organizational plan that is larger than the self uh, and is substantive and and hierarchical. And then there's all kinds of views in between. So there's a there's a broad spectrum, and it varies across different religions and. Uh, different places and different cultures, you know. But, but we're trying to focus on the uh, Bajoran religion yeah. in this case. I think within DS9, there are different people who will stress different aspects of it. Don't you think? I think that's important. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like Chris was saying. I think um, even though many religions will favor one or the other aspects of it, in a lot of cases, those other aspects are still there. And given the nature of orb experiences and, and how people can actually, you know, talk with their prophets through these various visions and whatnot, I think Chris is generally right that the Bajoran religion probably is uh, more of the lived experience side of things. But at the same time, since our topic tonight is about the Kais, I think we're probably going to be looking at that organization and uh, institutional side of things. Which is well, still there, just not as strong. Certainly with Kai Wen, the organizational aspect is stressed at the expense of the lived experience aspect. Um, and Which I actually think the, brings us into the political aspects as well. Right. Oh, definitely. I think the Star Trek writers, I think, take a very dim view of the organizational or hierarchical aspect and want to stress the 
lived experience aspect whenever possible and not stress the other. I think, though, that some defense of the need for both considerations can be made, although it's it's difficult to find enough common ground to make it across all religions, at least for many of them. I think one could argue that both aspects are very important to a great many religions. Wouldn't, don't you think? It seems like, it's at least by the time we get around to the last season, no, really, even in the first season, the organizational aspect is important because it keeps the Bajoran people together. And that's uh, what, uh, that's what Kira, that's said. What Kira that's says in the first episode. So yeah. both aspects are might be important. Both you know? aspects, you mean all three or what do you mean? Oh, yeah, all three. Okay. I think there's something worth noting though. Mm -hmm. And it's the way we perceive religion. And that's I that I think is primary here. Because uh, the writers are going to portray religion as sometimes extremely negative. Other times, extremely positive, i.e., it can reform people's lives. Zach will have an orb experience, and he goes from being this greedy, selfish Ferengi to being, you know, the charitable type. Mm -hmm. uh, the orb experience can be, it can offer something of clarity. We look at people who say, I'm not uh, religious, I'm spiritual, and say, oh, well, there's something wonderful and admirable and virtuous in that. Well, and is there really? No one in our culture professes to be religious. Well, I do. No one. Well, you do, but you're a rare breed. I mean, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it, I mean, is Judaism a religion? No, they say it's a culture. Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship. Buddhism isn't a religion, it's a way of life. I mean, heaven forbid you call atheism religion, then the internet gets mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> That's certainly true. Yeah, so nobody's religious anymore. Even, uh, even it, it has a kind of gained a, a negative connotation. In There's all kinds years. of Nietzschean aspects to what you just said of nobody wanting to be called religious anymore. <laughs> I know. I mean, Nietzsche's won. The, the, the Marxists have won. No, religion has been <laughs> abolished. I've heard pastors give sermons about how bad religion is as they are at their weekly religious sermon, doing their religious activities, <laughs> collecting their religious tithes. No, no, no. They hate religion. Give me a break, guys. But still, religion has a lot of negative connotations but spirituality has positive connotations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in deep space nine i mean to bring it back uh, home for us which is in the 24th century uh, you've you've got spirituality having very positive connotations nobody's going to argue that spirituality is a positive thing in deep space nine but there's you still mean that nobody's going to argue that it isn't a positive thing in deep space nine well, for Akira Norris and Zach and uh, Vedic yeah. uh, Burial, I mean, they're they're wonderful people. Like they're they're. Yeah, like, I was just saying that because you missed the uh, negative, so it came out the opposite of what I think you meant. <laughs> there you have it. But you you've got this uh, this experience in Deep Space Nine as you're watching the show that the writers have a remarkably positive view of what spirituality. But they still portray a, you know, Vedics as sometimes power hungry, sometimes trying to oppress truth, sometimes doing X, Y, and Z. So religion can still have all the negativities, while spirituality has the the positivities. I thought that sort should of. weigh a little in this conversation that we're having. Yeah, certainly, I don't know. Um... I think they seem to sort of go for religion always bad, spirituality sometimes good, because the interactions with the Pa wraiths could also be described as spiritual. So I think they recognize uh, sort of a, a good and evil in, in a spiritual world, uh, but they don't like religion, you know? You have people like Jake Sisko who are portraying themselves as legitimately interested in religion as this third party objective oh i, I kind of want to have this understanding of religion 
and oh, did you get to meet a Pa Wraith when you were there? And this sort of, <laughs> and then he has a firsthand experience with a Pa Wraith, and it's a demon. And then all of a sudden, he understands why his father would kill his own son just to get rid of the Pa Wraith. And they're they're pure evil. And, and <laughs> there's religion as this thing which you can observe according to anthropology and then there's this religion as you can experience it firsthand and it doesn't make sense and everything in your life totally changes and you do a 180 and things that didn't make sense now make sense because you just had a religious experience and to me I thought that was wonderful because a lot of people look at religion to study it is yeah. the subject of the object and then religion encompasses them and they're like oh this actually is totally different than what i think there's this whole new dimension yeah they get caught up in the politics of it and kind of miss the spirit of it exactly chris you hit the nail on the head i thought deep space nine was wonderful and how they had people looking at it anthropologically and then it consumes them and it totally changes <laughs> They have to look at it. Yeah. Bill, what about uh, your opinions here? You've been silent. Well, I mean, so far I've pretty much agreed with everybody. I'm not feeling overly cantankerous on it. I, I think there are elements of a little bit of everything they were saying. I personally remember the first season. Was it half a season? Did she even make it through the whole first season with Kyle Paca? I uh, don't huh? remember. I, th I know I mean, she left in the first season. Yeah, it was about three quarters of the way through, maybe. Yeah, and she got like trapped on that endless planet. She was probably... I don't think she'd call herself trapped. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's part of what made her the, the best of the Kais. Because oh, yeah. she did embody that, that personal spirituality, that, that guruism. She could just say something wise to anybody in any situation and at the same time she could be the Kai as in the head honcho running the office without needing to exploit or um, to emphasize oh I'm the head of the Bajoran religion you have to listen to me she was the head of the Bajoran religion because right. people listened to her instead of right. brilliant Yes, I, th I think what Kai Opaka embodied for the writers, at, at least their intention, and I think the actress portrayed it wonderfully, was what the Bible calls having authority of God and not of man, and what in the East they call chi, or spiritual power. Well, not really, you know, spiritual authority is more like it. Well, some would call it ki. Or, yeah, but that. Whatever. I'm, uh, that's probably it, key. And it's it's this sort of thing where they have this ability to make a statement, and to those who hear it, they cannot honestly doubt it. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you can you can still doubt it, but you seem to lose this ability to honestly doubt it. It's sort of like on this deep down level. You know that the thing is true uh, when someone who has that sort of inspiration says something to you in that mode. And that is a, that is a subjective experience uh, in that you know it's something that happens to you. And though you can perhaps repeat the words to someone else, you can't replicate the experience for anyone else. But it – concerns a matter of an objective truth, a truth that is beyond your uh, empirical sorts of experiences, right? It's not just your opinion, you know, but at the same time, it's not proven in the empirically objective sense either. So it really messes with your, uh, <laughs> with your subjective objective distinction in strange ways, really. It's subjectively justified but it's an objective matter. Does that make any sense to you guys? You've kind of lost me, I'll be honest. Um, well, Brandon, do you know what I'm talking about? I think so. Um, 
Well, I mean, I understand exactly what you mean about Kyle Paca uh, basically having sort of the charisma that, uh, and the actress portrayed, well, I, I agree with you, that makes you just want to believe whatever she said. I think she was elected because she held uh, such a high amount of, of faith in, well, the, I think, in their religion. Well, hold on, though. I think charisma is not quite the right word for it because a politician can have charisma and yet be able to lie to you. Peter Crave told us a little story that I think might help explain this difference. And this also goes into the difference between uh, the difference between a politician and the sort of uh, person and personal experience I'm talking about here. You know, a politician like Wynn and a spiritual leader like uh, Opaka. And uh, it's the difference between the concepts of power and authority. And it might also in, in existentialist terms be described as the difference between the will to truth and Nietzsche's will to power. And uh, it's, a, it's a Buddhist story, I believe. It goes uh, basically like, like, like this. There's a, uh, a swordsman who's the greatest swordsman in the land who meets a Buddhist monk on the road. And this monk is supposed to be the wisest in all the land. And this young swordsman is very haughty and proud and, and so forth. And the swordsman sort of makes fun of the monk and says, you Buddhist monks, you think you're so wise, you know, I mean, but you, you guys don't really know anything. I could easily, you know, defeat you, you know, without even trying. I mean, how do you guys say you're wise, you know, when you have all, all that? And the Buddhist monk looks at him and says, well, I can show you the gates of hell and the gates of heaven. And the swordsman says, there's, yeah, there's no way you can do that. What are you talking about? And the monk says, well, you're a fool if you think I can't. And this makes the swordsman very angry. And so he draws his sword to uh, kill the monk. And the monk points at the eyes of the swordsman and says, I have now shown you the gates of hell. And this recalls the swordsman to sanity or, you know, calms him down and he puts his sword away. And the monk points to that and says, I have now shown you the gates of heaven. And I think the story is supposed to end that the swordsman was so impressed that he gave up his sword fighting and decided to become a Buddhist monk himself or something to that effect. But what this story represents is the concepts of power and authority and the difference between the two, where the swordsman represents power and the monk represents authority. And the swordsman represents the will to power and the monk represents the will to truth in that it is not the it is not his his strength that creates the the justification or moral rightness or justice of his statements, but is this this spiritual authority that he has? It's not his power, but the truth of his statement that gives him a kind of power, which the swordsman doesn't have. So does that does this make sense? I think so, but let me just make sure I understand what, exactly what you're saying. What you're saying is there's a Kaiopaka who has this sort of natural authority, which is her being so in touch with objective truth that it is so natural for her to lord over everyone else that nobody really questions it and she's not really attempting to lord over everyone else it just naturally happens and then there's a kai win who it is a, a, an artificial lording over everyone else she's not in touch with the objective truth in the same way Opaka is. And Opaka is in touch with the objective truth such that we have a subjective experience with it where we say, okay, that woman is authoritative. And what she just said is authoritative, not because she is authoritative, but because of the nature of what she just said. Uh, uh, 
Uh, is, is that approaching what you're saying, or am I totally missing it? Some parts you get close. One thing I might point out, though, is that the will to truth remains true regardless of whether it is backed up by power or not. So, sure, yeah. So, Kyle Paca, for example, we would imagine such a person still behaving almost exactly the same way, whether they are in power or not. When I was saying that Opaka has a charisma, well, Wynn has a charisma, too. It depends on how they use their charisma. Obviously, Opaka is very genuine about it. Wynn is the duplicitous one. She has very fake charisma and uses it just to get power. She's the consummate politician. <laughs> In defense of Wynn, and it is really, really hard to defend Kai Wynn because <laughs> she's just incredibly creepy. But in her defense, I mean – She's wrong, but she believes she's right. Oh, well, everyone is the hero of their own story. Yeah, so I mean, she really does, in her own way, she does care about the Bajoran people. Until the end. Yeah, when she strips off her robe and says, I'm not going to pretend anymore. I mean, in, yeah. in, the, very, in the very end... Yeah, that, she gives that, up on that. But most of the show, yes. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to have an episode just specifically devoted to the <laughs> end of the series and why it was so horribly, horribly, horribly wrong on so many levels. Okay, I look forward to that. I, one. I, I don't think so. I mean, well, we'll save it. <laughs> it 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 was rushed. It was rushed, and it didn't develop it as well as it should have. But I think the basic direction of the ending was all right. Uh, well, we'll get to that. But I mean, back to the win thing. I mean, yeah, she um, – and it's the, – the, the thing we should probably talk about briefly to uh, put the trek in this osophy is the relationship between the win – or the Kai and the emissary, both what it's supposed mm -hmm. to be and what it actually was as it played out between Cisco and the various Kais. Well, as I understand it, the Kai is basically she's the spiritual leader, or he is the spiritual leader of Bajor, sort of like the Pope is in you know, Catholicism on our planet. Whereas the Emissary, of course, we don't really have an analog to that here, but the Emissary is sort of the person who speaks with the prophets, and thus she helps the Kai, or is supposed to anyway, help the Kai make decisions – he he does the blessings. He does all that you know, good stuff. Anyone? Uh, yeah, I think the well, we do analog. have an analog to the emissary, and and that is Christ in Christianity, the Messiah in Judaism, the uh, avatars of various gods in some Eastern uh, systems, and certain and uh, demigods in in Greek religion. I guess I, think I was thinking of yeah, that's a good point. I was thinking of someone to, living rather, but <laughs> well, I mean yeah. that, that's a good way to put it. If yeah. uh, if Jesus came back today, would the Pope answer to him, or would he answer to the Pope? And it's like the way you're Ooh, describing the system. I yes. mean that's because because Jesus is all about the humility, is all about that. Uh, I'm just some guy, you know. That's what he said over and over again. <laughs> I'm I'm just some guy, you know. I'm nothing special. It's not me. Wait, it's the message. Uh, he didn't say that. I'm sorry. That was not. No, he I've didn't been, say I, that. I've been He's paraphrasing. I'm He's I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing generically. <laughs> I, I mean, here it is, and this is my contribution to the whole conversation. I can't remember who it was, but I think it was a gentleman by the name of Bill Allen who raised the question, uh, one of the lesser-known works of Bill Allen, but he still raised the question, uh, would the Kai answer to the emissary or vice versa? And that's the question that I really want to think – that's the question I want to raise with respect to the Kais in terms of their – in touchedness with the prophets. And the only reason why I want to raise that question is because of the practical import. And here I go quoting Kierkegaard once again. We can import this into the Deep Space Nine. We'll import the same way Kierkegaard does for us today. He says, <laughs> try to envision 
our mentalities with which we approach religion try to transpose them into first century Palestine and see if they recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And if they do, you're good to go. But if they don't, you've done something terribly, terribly wrong. I think Kierkegaard is absolutely right on that. I know. And now here he goes. Whereby we're expecting a Messiah, or in our conversation, an emissary, or a Kai. Let's think about the authority of the Kai. Kierkegaard says we're expecting a Messiah because we're first century Palestinians. And what do we say? And I quote Kierkegaard. Therefore, the authentic expected one will look entirely different. He will come as the most glorious flowering in the highest unfolding of the established order. That is how the authentic expected one will come. He will conduct himself quite differently. He will recognize the established order as the authority and will summon all the clergy to a convention, present to it his achievements together with his credentials, and then if in balloting he has the majority, he will be accepted and hailed as the extraordinary that he is, the expected one. And he's, he's being, saying – He's being absurd here, right? Precisely. Uh, <laughs> He's saying, we have councils, we have votes, we have balloting, we have the majority, and therefore we're going to recognize the Messiah via balloting, via church councils, via credentials. Does this actually recognize the Messiah? No, it doesn't. Therefore, you miss authentic religion. Now, Let's transpose this. Okay, well, we can do this on 21st century uh, Brandon, Benjamin, Chris, and Bill religion, but let's do it for 24th century. How do we recognize the authority of Kai, the emissary? Is it in balloting? Is it in the council, the clergy, the, the voting, the ballots? No, Cisco didn't have any of that. And yet he was still authoritative. People still gravitated towards him. There was still a wisdom, a subjective appreciation of his wisdom. In spite of his not having any sort of support from councils or clergy or the opinions of man. Well, as I recall, it, it was Opaka that grabbed his ear and said, ah, you are the emissary. That's, that's what I was going to yeah, as she, well, it she, seems to me that it was people's respect for Kyle Paca that compelled them to accept this outsider as the emissary. Uh, there and was they, an extremely reluctant acceptance, but there was but, a re, there was a recognition there. It helped that he kept fulfilling a bunch of prophecies too. <laughs> I mean, that's the one thing that kind of I exactly mean, when you I have might, prophecies sorry. and they come true, and you know, sure. That does all kind I'm of point to. I might mention I'm uh, real quick my perspective as a Christian on on uh, Bill's question real of uh, who would respect who. I, I think Christianity gives a definitive answer or set of answers on that in the Gospels. Jesus is placed by the Father under the authority of both the high priest and the secular government. And he says this in his trial, in, in the, the trial of Jesus. He says that God has placed you who are trying me in authority over me. Ben, this is the question i got to ask you. I mean, given that the Vedics are back crazy sometimes, and the priests today can be nuts, why uh, – why would you submit yourself to an authority that has crucified Jesus? Why Why is it necessary to recognize that? The, the Vedics, I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, it's some Vedics are nuts, some Vedics aren't. 
And what's the criteria whereby we recognize one rather than the other? We Opaka was great. Win was nuts. Uh, uh, certainly. But well, I, I they, think they also, hold the same office, so that's the whole point. They hold the same office. They're so also, great. Um, they're, they were actually doing different things with the emissary. I mean, Opaka kind of had an easier time dealing with the emissary because she was basically – teaching him about the religion. She wasn't really out to steer the emissary in any particular direction. She was actually trying to convince the dude that that was the job he needed to do. And, you know, he figures it out after she is quote unquote dead. And he starts taking his duties seriously. And then he gets to dealing with a new guy who, okay, you're the emissary. You figured it out. Now you've got to do what I tell you so we can get the most mileage out of you being emissary. So it's like one was just trying to teach him who he was, and the other one was trying to show him how he could do the best with what he was. Sure. Well, then let's let's take the, the role to the Vedic realm. I mean, you have a Burial who can work with him, and we all recognize his pious and virtuous and good and so forth. And then you have Wynn, Vedic Wynn, let's go to Vedic Wynn, who is a bloviating charlatan, who is cruel, who is treacherous and backstabbing in X, Y, and Z. One we recognize is exercising his authority to bring about goodness – and the other one who is recognizing or who is exercising her authority to bring about bad things. One is good, one is bad. Let's contemplate the differences between the two. Let's contemplate the difference between goodness and badness in the office mm. of Vedic. See, that's it's it's a harder call to make. I mean, do the ends justify the means? Because one of the things that stood out of my mind as a memory is Vedic Wynn didn't really like the Federation there. She was opposed to joining right. the Federation, which was part of why she didn't like the idea of Cisco as the emissary. Right? Mm -hmm. Am that's I exactly, it, that's exactly what I remember. Right. Part of it, I think a bigger part of it was her jealousy that – Cisco actually has interacted with the prophets when she never got to. And of course, I think the reason she never got to was because of her being with the whole will to power instead of the will to truth. But yeah. Right. So that was her from the get go. Didn't really want to be part of the Federation. Then uh, Cisco, as a duty bound Federation officer, is trying to convince people that they should join the Federation. Until he has a vision, and then he's opposed to Bajor joining the Federation. Now, Wynn believed Bajor joining the Federation would be bad, and it turns out she was right. So don't we have to give her – like? partial credit for not being always completely selfish and doing bad things. I mean, she was minor amount of credit perhaps because what I think she was right because she got lucky. She got I, I'm, I'm Cisco uh when he uh, had the vision that Bajor should not join the Federation. That was just a matter of timing. He said it was too soon that they shouldn't join just yet. And speaking of too soon, unfortunately we've reached the end of this podcast too soon. All right, boys and girls, that's all the time we have for this evening. Thank you for joining us. Tune in next week as we bring you more of the Star Trek philosophy that you've come to know and love. Uh, I'd like to thank our hosts for devoting their time and their bar tabs to furthering our little project here. Check us out at trekosophy.com. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Email us, uh, trekosophy at gmail.com. Check us out in the iTunes store. Leave us a review, questions, feedback, comments, whatever. One of these days soon, we're going to do a mailbag episode, so we need you guys to actually send us mail for us to respond to. Good advice. Yes. Fill it with questions for the philosophers of the future. 
Absolutely. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, it's going to end up being... I don't know what the question's going to be, but it's All two questions quick. that we'll get. Yeah. I'm sure we, if we put it out there, we'll, we'll, we'll put a post on Facebook where people can post questions for our upcoming mailbag episode, and eventually we will answer them. I'll be like, whose wife do you think was hotter, uh, Surax or Kayless? <laughs> Kayless. <laughs> but anyway, that's a separate issue. Thank you, good yeah, night, Kayla. and keep your paws strong and your orbs locked up, and we'll see you next week. What was that? What? I think he just got beamed up. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Uh, I was hoping, hoping you could tell you. us. Yeah, I mean, it sounded like, you know, Scotty was experimenting with the transporters a little too much just now. You've been offline for four hours, man. You've got this huge chunk of missing time. Bill Allen. It's in a special <laughs> file he has labeled called blackmail. Someday we'll be famous. Somebody <laughs> here will be rich and famous, and he'll have these recordings to call him up and say, remember that time you told me where you hid the bodies? Now you got to pay. The dumbest idea in Star Trek ever. I mean, other than Dr. Fox. That was one of the lesser-known works of Jacob. It's a table for schism. Yeah, so that would make you a, a, a generic Protestant. Yeah. It's one of those things I was thinking about. You know, Data probably would have had a much easier time believing himself to be human if he'd have gotten a dog instead of a cat. You know what? You might be right. I mean... Because cats don't even treat humans like humans, so it's no wonder Data had... Uh, you know, issues. Doesn't go quite in the direction I'd like it to, but yeah, that that's a valid aspect of that episode. We could cover it. When does this show ever go in the direction we'd <laughs> like it to? <laughs> I try, man. I try. Yeah, it's like, oh, it, it evolves him. He's more advanced. He's a fish. Maybe you could also explain who he is during the podcast, too. Not a chance. They I'm don't get so it. They're probably... totally ignorant. Oh, you love Kierkegaard. Kirby needs no. to start drinking Irish coffee. That way he Irish gets his coffee. booze and he gets his caffeine. And the caffeine keeps him awake while the booze keeps him Kirby-fied. Trekosophy, where we make up terrible new words that no man has made up before. What, what happened? I have no idea what you guys are talking about. See? Some... He's got missing time, too. There's like four whole seconds missing. He was abducted by aliens. Great philosophy is founded on alcohol. One of these Have days, fun. we're going to end up getting on tape. Brandon saying, that's it for me, folks. And then you're going to hear this thump <laughs> as his head hits the desk. <laughs> Didn't that happen? Okay, I am uh, I'm back. Welcome back, Connor. We, we can't just start sounding organized and concise and coherent. What would people think? It would be totally different. Uh-oh, we lost Kirby. And we did? Back. Oh, no. Are you okay? Hey, Kirby, you there? I'm back. I'm better great. than ever. <laughs> I hit the wrong button. <laughs> okay, great. Stop hitting buttons, Kirby. A priest, a minister, and a rabbi walk into Quarks. I just found out that tomorrow's classes and my having to go to work is canceled due to inclement weather, so I get a snow day. Hooray!